Welcome to Death and Aliens, an in-depth look at horror and sci-fi TV from two cousins who vaguely know what they're doing. I'm MK. And I'm Monica. And um, if we're being real honest, uh, I was very, very intoxicated last night at the engagement party for my best friends. And um, so getting ready this morning was kind of a disaster. So I've been talking to Monica already for five hours almost. So I don't really know how much there is left to say. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the most entertaining thing probably would have been like the pre-filming of this episode. Um, we watched some TikTok. We laughed at some funny tweets. Um, um, I pulled Monica's boyfriend on Doctor Who trivia. Yep. But the thing is, if you go up against Mary Kate or um, her father in any sort of Doctor Who trivia, just here's a simple, just don't. You won't win. They are the walking dictionary. If Doctor Who had a dictionary that had legs for every single thing that happened, like a world event book, but of Doctor Who, that is collectively Mary Kate and her father. I mean, there's this podcast that I listen to called Radio Free Scaro. Shout out to them who will never listen to the, our podcast, but that's fine. Um, they are probably the only people that I would like not actually that I would not actually want to go against because like they know who composed every episode, who produced every episode, like when it was, what days it was actually filmed, like they know a lot. So then you and your dad are then the second people, like second right. place. Right, okay. yeah, yeah. We're like, we're like second tier nerd kings, like not. not. You're, but you're close. I feel like, yeah. like you know the stuff that a lot of people probably have questions on, like they would too, but like they notice a little bit extra. Like the right, like I, I'm the kind of dictionary where if you need to know something that's actually useful, I can tell you. If you need to know things that are not useful, I could find it very quickly. Yes, and that's me. Um, I'm like a <laughs> jack of all trades, but a master of none. Um, Fun I know fact, that statement used to be jack of all trades, master of one not master of none, because you were supposed to be able to attempt everything, but be really good at one thing. And then we all got lazy. Yeah, so like the only one good thing that I think I'm actually good at is makeup. Like there are areas that I could be a little spotty with, but overall, I think that is one that I have mastered. Um, I have mastered um, understanding how okay. stupid men are. Oh yeah, you know what? Sign me up for that one too. Because, so I did an experiment this week just to prove how self-centered and dumb men are. Oh, boy. <laughs> I put a Snapchat filter on that gave me neck and face tattoos. And I sent this to all of my best friends. And I was like, oh my God, I look so hot. I should definitely get a face tattoo. Anyone who knows me knows I would never get a fucking face tattoo, but. I'm a yes man, so I think when you sent me that, I said yes, fucking do yeah, it. Yeah, no, you said yes. Um, you said yes. The only girl who had any complaints was one of my best friends who's also a teacher, um, and Jillian said, you would look like a badass, but it's probably not practical, which is fair, because that's true. Mm -hmm. But all the girls were like, yes, queen, you look so hot. You should definitely do it. You're a badass. You could pull that off. Look at you go. <laughs> um, one boy, and by boy, I mean man, the only, the only man who I will ever trust, said, hey, you never know until you try. That was if Brian. it goes back, you do it off. Thanks, Brian, for uh, caring. Good job, Brian. Every other man just texted me, no. And I said, why not? You don't like it? And they're like, no, I don't like it. I didn't ask you what you liked. I said I looked good, bitch. See, here's the thing. Like every, uh, like every single guy without fail, except Brian was like, no, I don't like it. But like, I wasn't asking. It's not your you face. Like it's not your face. And even the question wasn't, do you like, do you think I look hot? Do you like this tattoo? It was, I look like a badass. Should I get a face tattoo? Which is, if like where um, 
Jillian had said, you would look great, but for practical use, probably not. That is an actual answer. Not because one man's penis is like, no, my penis won't like that. Can't get it. And it Sorry. wasn't one man. It was not one man. It was, four. it was, oh yeah, it was a bunch. It was four. four. Four men told me they didn't like it. I told my boyfriend I was going to tattoo the word fuck on the inside of my lip, and he said, go for it. <laughs> Granted, you couldn't see it, but, like, it would just be so easy to just do this instead of saying it. But, like, first of all, obviously, I say I'm going to do a lot of dumb shit that I'm not going to do. I'm not going to get a face tattoo. I would like to work at Disney for the rest of my life. I'm not going to get a face tattoo. Exactly. You can't really be, like, a Disney princess if, or in the safari if you have, like, fuck bitches get money tattooed across your forehead like right also i would never want a face tattoo that was words because do you know how hard it would be to take a selfie oh what everything would be backwards <laughs> like there are some women who can act like people like not even just women but people that can pull off face tattoos in a way that i could only dream but like that would never happen yeah so i um obviously in no world was I getting a face tattoo. This was just a social experiment to see if men would say anything other than what they thought was attractive for themselves. And the answer, mm -hmm. with one exception, was of course not. They suck. Exactly. And another fun thing is that, because me and Mary Kate were talking about a lot of stigmas earlier and a lot of social issues, because we can talk about that stuff. Because like, regardless of where we stand, in any like political political standpoint when it comes down to the same like basic needs we are pretty much the same person and i think that's what a lot of things need to be dulled down to at the end of the day but that's a different discussion for a different time but i think with like the the stigma with guys boys because a real man won't genuinely care what you should do to yourself to make you feel good because it's not their body, it's yours. Like, it's one thing, like, yes, I might tell my boyfriend I like your hair long, but if he cuts it, I'm not going to break up with him. Like, it's, you are, like, when you are very much allowed to have things that you find attractive. You are very yeah. much allowed to have preferences. What you are not allowed to do is tell a woman that she has to fit into your preference. Exactly. And like, and another funny thing that I just think is a really, is be, coming from someone who does makeup as an art form, not yes. just because it makes me feel pretty or anything like that. Because Never I look tell at me it, I look better without makeup. Don't ever tell me I look better without makeup. Exactly. Like I have, like my, like Cody will always tell me, he's like, you look beautiful either way. Yeah, like, no, you can tell me I'm beautiful when I'm not wearing makeup, but don't tell me, oh, I like it better when you don't wear makeup. I didn't exactly. wear this makeup to look good for you. I wore it because I enjoy doing it. Exactly. And that's like the thing where I, a lot of guys, not boys, because once I said, men will understand why women actually do what they do. Um, a lot of boys will look at a girl with makeup and go like that's too much for me well good thing i wasn't doing it my you. least favorite trend on the internet is men being like can you imagine what you'd actually look like when you wake up in the morning or like, like talking imagine. about how, like makeup is a catfish i'm like no a catfish is a man having a beard who has no fucking chin i've dated one of them have you seen right and link from good mythical more morning or well, right from good mythical morning that is the catfish bro. i watched a tiktok where this girl used a filter that would show what her husband's face looked like with no beard yes. and she just started cracking up she was like don't ever see me i saw that tiktok too I, but like that's so, it's like it's like if a woman said i don't like guys with small chins you have to have a beard you're not a man if you don't have a beard or you know what i really don't like beards it's a little that's a little too much you're a catfish right now it's like granted that's I don't know you what can't. your face really looks like because you've got so much hair on it. Exactly. Like I understand it's not technically a catfish because it's something that you don't apply, but it's something you can change. I mean, yeah, I, I think it's the same as like girls dyeing their hair. Yeah. Like I don't my hair I is don't, mostly black. I mean, technically my hair is my natural color right now, but that's because COVID. Um, but and actually, truthfully, I don't like my hair super dark, but I will say when my hair is dark, 
it makes doing my eyebrows a lot easier because I have a color to match them to. Yeah. <laughs> because I have albino eyebrows, which is great when my hair is really pale. But on camera, it's very obvious that I have albino eyebrows, so I fill them in. And when my hair is really blonde, my eyebrows look too dark for my face. Oh. Yeah. Ooh, that's like right in the sweet spot. Yeah, it is. My eyebrows, it's like the perfect blonde where I have to fill them in because on camera they disappear. But when I fill them in and my hair is dyed, then I look like it's obvious that one of them's fake. Yeah. And like... And unfortunately, for... both of them are fake, so... <laughs> like, I have like mouse brown hair. But I, it's like, my hair color looked pretty in the sunlight. But... In the middle of winter when there's no pretty sun and it looked like my hair was dead. Like, I just felt like this is the hair that a corpse would have. So, I, I said, honestly don't remember the last time you had your natural hair color. It's been a long time. Like, also, I, so I mean, time. other than when I moved to Asia and didn't have a hairdresser on hand anymore, when's the last time anybody saw my natural hair color? True. Like, I can tell hair- you, it's when I was 11. So I started dyeing time. I started dyeing my hair when I was 12. I and I have not had natural hair. Like I've had blonde that looked more natural and then I've had crazy colors, but like I have not had this is the most my natural my hair has been in literally 18 years. I have had I started I got highlights in my hair and ombre when I was 12 or 13 where my natural roots were still showing, so, like, it wasn't full, but when I went full out crazy, like, I did, like, a crazy bleach where a lot of my, my blonde was dyed, and then my, the rest of my hair was a little bit lighter, so I had highlights and lowlights put in my hair. That was when I was about 14, and then I went, like, purple magenta, and then I went blue, and then I went black and blonde and then I was red and then I was like this weird auburn chestnut brown for a minute there so what happened was I was 12 and I convinced my parents to let me temporarily box dye my hair auburn like really nice strawberry red because I was being Nancy Drew for Halloween but also So we've discussed this recently in episodes. Um, I had some uh, issues with uh, sexual predators as a child. Um, And the the person in question um, only liked blonde kids. So I originally convinced my parents to let me do it for Halloween, but then kind of like really the decisions were led by psychological trauma and was like, I was like, if I'm not blonde, he'll stop trying to find me. Of course he was in jail, so he didn't know what my hair color was, but like that was, that was my thought process. So then I can... So then I continued to dye my hair red. There, It started as very natural strawberry blonde, like auburn, very close to my natural hair color. Because as you can see, my natural hair color is a very dark blonde. Mm-hmm. And then by the time I was 15, it was like purple anime red. Yeah. Um... And then I didn't go back to blonde until I was 19. Like, I literally was like, I would not be a blonde as a child. It wasn't until I was fully an adult that I went back to blonde. And then I went back to red for a couple of years. And then when I got a job at Disney, I went back to blonde because Disney doesn't, Disney doesn't have a problem with dyed hair. It just has to look natural. And for me, because my hair is blonde, the upkeep of like my light blonde, like dyeing it from dark blonde to light blonde um, is easier and looks more natural than dyeing it from red because this shade of blonde 
growing out into red hair looks like I have gray roots. So yeah. it's very obvious that my hair is dyed. When I grow it out into blonde, it looks like a natural like balayage ombre. And because I worked outside, my hair was lighter just naturally from being outside all the time. So my thought process was it'll be easier to have blonde hair because then I won't have to dye it as often. Yeah. And then I just got lazy and never went back. Yeah. And for me, I tried, as you guys know on the podcast, I ended up lifting my hair and having some orange in there for a bit. Um, I liked it, but then I remembered why I don't bleach my hair. So, um, well, I just, we didn't, we didn't talk about the phase in college where my hair was mostly blonde, but then it was also, so, um, as we talked about, I was your classic scene kid and, uh, I was a freshman in college the year it was really, really popular to have um, the top half of your hair blonde and the bottom half of your hair black, like Nicole Richie. And mine was reversed. Mine was top black and then ends were blonde. Oh, but no, but I mean like literally this, if I pulled my hair into a half pony, the ponytail would be blonde and everything down would be black. Oh, like, the like underneath. The literally, like the literally two different hairs. Oh, like my orange hair where I had the underneath part done. Yes. The front. Yes. Except for nothing in the front. Like literally, like it looks like you clipped in a fucking different hair piece on the bottom half of your head. I don't know. Nicole Richie did it and we all thought it was great. The 2000s were a really weird time. Um, <laughs> and I did that, but my hair, because it's naturally blonde and then also bleached, it's super porous and it doesn't necessarily take color the way I meant for it to. So when I tried to dye it black, it turned indigo blue and then faded to green. And then I didn't like the green, so I dyed it purple. And then the purple faded to pink. And then I really liked the pink, so I kept it pink. And I think I had 15 different hair colors in the first six months of college. Honestly, if my hair was a light color and I could do that, I would have too. But having dark brown hair with a lot of black box dye build up on it, it just isn't. Well, it. and then when I was about 23, I realized um, I need to stop doing my hair myself. I'm destroying it. And one of my closest friends finished cause school. So I was like, great. I'm going to stop box dyeing my hair now. Now I finally found a salon that actually does my hair right. So I don't need to box dye my hair. My hairdresser is also pregnant. And I'm very nervous that by the time I got home, she will be too pregnant to stand for as long as it is going to take to fix my hair. Want me to do it? No. <laughs> Until you finish school, I'm not trusting you with my head because I've that's seen fine. what you've done to your own head. But that's not any knowledge, duh. Which is why I'm waiting for you to go back to school. A tee hee. <laughs> um, Mostly we're just avoiding getting into Hemlock Grove because this episode was a lot. Like, it was like, it was a lot in the sense where there were big moments and big parts that had happened. And honestly, Mary Kate, I know we were talking earlier. I honestly think we could go time between. Sorry, can you hear that banging? Now that you mentioned it, yeah, but not loud enough where it's like, to, like oh, when you okay, talk. It, for me, it's really loud. It literally sounds like the person in the apartment above me is building something on their balcony. I don't know what is going on. I love Sorry, that. I was trying to listen to you, but then somebody was beating something, and it wasn't their meat. And <laughs> I really think we should go in storyline, but it would only be in two parts. It would be Peter Roman and then Olivia Price and Shelley, because those are the two distinct things that don't cross, and I think it would be easy. But they do that. cross. Because Price is also involved in the Peter Roman storyline a lot. Well, like, for a second where it wouldn't make the other plot make That's sense. That's true. Where we would okay. We tried to discuss 
how we were going to film this. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry, you froze for a second, but we tried to discuss how we were going to film this uh, last night while I was very intoxicated, and I said, I don't know. I don't even remember the episode. So, and Monica hadn't watched it yet at that point, so it was a really poor planning. Yeah, and then we started talking about just random shit that's just been going on, and then we never really got to it until right this very moment before we had to talk about the show. Yeah. But... I think that would probably be the best way for us to handle it, just because of how punky both of those storylines are, that it's like, I would rather just talk about that one whole big chunk and that whole one big chunk. That's fair. Um, um, quickly, before we start this, I don't remember if I said this on last week's episode. I'm sure I did. But I'm going to say it again. Mm -hmm. Everyone, go watch Raya and the Last Dragon. Just watch it. Just do it. It's the best movie I ever saw. Also, it is fully written and performed by Asian American actors, and they need our support right now a lot because. People yeah. Just suck. Yeah. So, um,. <laughs> And in other news, we had mentioned it in last week's episode, um, but it was at the very end of the episode after I kind of told everyone to bugger off. Yeah, we were like, spoilers, don't listen, but then told not spoiler stuff too, so. Um, but in how many episodes from now? Two? Two episodes. After the, after two, so in three this episodes, one, the third episode. This one, the finale, yeah, so. Three. And so three episodes. Yes. Three episodes from when this one comes out will be the first annual DNA Awards for Death and Valley. And by annual, um, probably annual is the wrong word because we'll probably do it after every show that we finish. Um, the, the, just the DNA Awards. Um, we're going to be hosting that um, for Hemlock Grove, for a bunch of different categories, you're going to have best episode, worst episode, because you have to support, there will be a lot of nominations for that one. Um, um, yeah. We have best director, best writer, best actor, best actress, best supporting. Best character journey. Exactly. And then, like, best, some fun. Best like, special episodes. effects. And hottest character, which we all know who that's going to. <laughs> we all know who that is going to, Mary-Kate. I don't know. Um, <laughs> there, there you go. That's the first award. It goes to Roman Godfrey. I'm not, or Price. I was going to say, you didn't even let me pull my nomination in. We'll each, one, we'll each have one, because me and you also both have very different tastes in that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, also not related to this, but kind of related to this, because we're talking about hottest men. Um, if anyone is interested the bachelorette just put out the pictures of the men who could potentially be on katie's season there's a man from connecticut who's 36 years old named bow who literally looks like if a disney animator in a traditional 2d animation drew a perfect asian prince and then he came to life I, I got pregnant looking at his picture. Oh. <laughs> uh, I can't wait. When's the due date? 14th of never. But make sure that you are in your <laughs> finest garb at 6.30 in the morning to listen to us give our DNA awards and give us feedback. Like, it's yeah. pretty exciting. Send us and your you nominations. Have- Exactly. Um, we'll actually have, maybe maybe when we record next week's episode, we can sit down and actually set like make a uh, a category list and then have select ones where the audience will. Yeah, we should probably like make people vote on our Insta story and something. Yeah, hopefully, just people need to vote on it and people need to have watched Hemlock Grove in order to. Courtney will be the deciding factor in every everything. Okay. It'll like I'll go to like look at the Instagram results and it'll be like one vote. Yeah. <laughs> 
Courtney's voice is completely, completely 100% trustworthy in all these decisions. She'll probably end up co-hosting the whole damn thing with us because she's just here for everything. We love Courtney. Yes. Um, Obviously, Courtney will again return for the uh, season three roundup yeah. episode. Which Ugh, it's coming. Well, it's coming, coming fast. We have one more episode left of the actual show. Like this, this is a home stretch, baby. What? It, and then we never have to talk about the show again, except for somehow we'll still end up talking about it. Yeah, it will just come up, and we'll just remember Roman Godfrey for the amazing, gorgeous man he once was. Instead of the honestly, obviously, man. Bill Skarsgård is beautiful, but like I knew who Bill Skarsgård was before the show. The one thing that I will take away from Hemlock Grove forever is having introduced me to the god that is Joel De La Fuente because I don't know how I've lived yeah. my whole life without knowing this man before. Absolutely. And one thing that I will be able to take away from this show is no matter how good of an actor they are, they can still give them a really shitty fucking role and make it suck. And that's not a diss to the actors. Oh, no, no. So, I, I don't think I've ever had problems with the acting on this show. Me neither. All the act- No matter what the actors were given, they did with it what they have done and what they could do. I mean, it. occasionally, occasionally in season one, there were some questionable choices from some of the supporting characters. But... Yeah. Yeah. And now, also with Miranda, I don't really know if that was bad acting or just the worst character ever. Yeah. So today's gonna be a fun episode for one reason. <sighs> Today this episode, just as a warning, I have some things that I'm planning to talk about. And one of them you're going to see the angriest you've ever seen me. This yeah, is the one I was telling both, you about last night. And um, one, of them, one of them, I am going to have a visible mental breakdown on camera. So. Yeah. Um, also, with this episode, and actually watching the episode, going through what we went through last season, um, and everything leading up to this episode. Um, this episode is a definition of when a guy finishes before the girl and just says sorry. That's what that, like, there was no climb. It was, like, very anticlimactic. It's like, instead of getting turned on, you're getting turned off. While um, having this, sex. this episode is literally that time that you had sex with a guy and... He finished before you even knew he was inside you. This is going to sound really weird what the next one is I'm about to say, but this is a joke. Did you watch me have sex in my past relationships? No, I did not. And luckily that only happened to me once. But. Wait, huh? What? <laughs> Wait, hold on. Time out, real quick. Are we talking about I saw you or someone saw you? Because I remember when you were into. No, your I'm talking about that. That sexual experience only happened once. Oh, okay, okay. I, here's um, the thing. I know my head game's good. I that's the thing because I know what I'm doing because I'm like I actually try to make it like be good. Here's the thing. This is number one way to make your head game good enjoy it yes um because a lot of girls don't and they just do it because they think guys want it um they do guys do just want it um and to be honest uh you could put a ziploc bag full of uh like uh slime and pretend that was your mouth and they'd still get off um Mm -hmm. but Sorry, now I was just imagining someone with a Ziploc bag full of slime. Um, but if you're having fun, mm-hmm. you will be better. 
Oh yeah. And that's the thing is like, cause, and that's why I could never be one of those people who just like randomly just does it to do it because I, in order for me to have fun, there has to be feeling there in order for it to be fun for me. To know that I'm doing mm. this to make this. The fun feeling that like, has to be there for me is tequila. Uh. <laughs> Bro, I love that. Like, but you want to know what? Here's my biggest gripe with men and sex. Guys, well, like, my ex is probably out there thinking she's never going to find anything better than me because of what she used to say about when we would have sex. And you want to know what? I was maybe telling the truth 40% of the time. Um, in a whole year, no, in three years of being with that person, not once did I ever do penetration. Never. I, I'm no cap faked it every time he would go down on me yeah because like duh but like it just wouldn't hit and like doesn't do much so you know it could if you have the skills and that's the thing like for me it's like it's not about the size of the boat it's the motion of the ocean but when you're on a fucking kayak fucking spinning in circles in the middle of the ocean in a tidal storm. No, you're not going to get anywhere. So you don't know what you're... It was, And this motherfucker's out there thinking that he's the best I probably will ever have. And that is a sad joke. And I had to boost this motherfucker's ego for him to take it and carry it on to disappoint more women. And you know what's but crazy? I... This episode of Hemlock Grove had no sex in it, and yet here we are. Because this is more entertaining to talk about our own sex lives for the whole world to hear instead of this show. Um, it would probably be true if I had a sex life. I literally don't even know what the last thing we were talking about before I cut. We were talking about sex beforehand. Yeah, I just haven't decided where I'm going to edit it, so... You want to just hop right into Hemlock Grove? Because we've been pushing it off long enough. Hemlock Grove. Season 3. Episode 9. Damascus. Wasn't there another episode that was similar, similarly named this, too? No. I just talked about this episode earlier. Because uh, I was telling Courtney about the biblical references. Um, only I don't really care for that being the title of this episode it didn't no anyway why why was there like damascus is the road or is a town that like so in the bible saul was this guy who was killing christians and then on his way to the town of damascus he was visited by god and changed his name from Saul to Paul and became like the greatest apostle. And like, whenever you hear people talk about like the saints, Peter and Paul are the first ones they always say. And Paul wrote half of the New Testament of the Bible. Um, but uh, I don't know the context. In this? In this episode, like I don't know why. Yeah. I don't see... Like, there was biblical stuff in this episode, but, like, not... Not... Not, to re not related to this. Yeah. So... It came out on October 23rd, 2015, and uh, it was directed by Russell Lee Fine, who is a returning director. He directed episode one of this season, and it was written by our main man, David Paul Francis. Dave um, I'm just very happy that he got to write the the death of this episode. Me too, because I think it was done beautifully. Yeah. Um, gruesome discoveries await Roman and Peter at Spivak's cabin. As Olivia's time runs out, she targets her son. Price consoles a heartbroken Shelley. Which, yes to all of those, but also when we talk about Olivia, which she isn't in this episode all that much, it's literally the first like three scenes and then that's it. 
Um, and then, I mean, yes, her end game is Roman. Um, no, she starts with Roman. But then that doesn't end up panning out well for her. No. None of this does. So, like I said before, end game is Roman, but that's not where she checks the box for, or tries to at least. Um, so, would you like to start with Peter and Roman or with the rest of the cast? I mean, either way. Because both, both stories kind of end big. Yeah. I think we should save Peter and Romans to the end because Because it's more more of a question mark. I agree. Yes. Okay. So the episode opens with Olivia at a feast. With Chongo. With Chongo. And I wrote Olivia straight bonkers at this point. There's no way any of this is happening. Mm -hmm. Um, Turns out it's not. Uh, she awakes from a dream, having started to bite her arm. Just like in the video of the rats, which means she's at that point where self-cannibalism is going to be starting. And, um, so she's like, gotta get a rush on this whole genetic match thing. And, um, Chango's like, you got two options. Uh, I would go for Annie because she's got a nicer ass, but um, probably for you, killing Roman would be more uh, pleasant. Important. Yeah. So uh, she decides that she's going to go after Roman. After Roman. (laughs) Bless you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to about girls sneezing and we'll get more views again this week. So she goes to Roman's house, but Roman has already left, so she's wandering around his house waiting for him. And uh, then Chango's like, we don't really have time to wait. And she's like, all right, well, I guess I'll find Annie. He's like, you will not find her in time. And she's like, I am not turning into Shelly. Mm-hmm. And, and then Chuck has, has this beautiful idea, which fuck basically internal monologue Olivia. Right. For this one. He, it basically, Chango is like, no, what you do is you take over Shelly, don't let the other kids know, and use being Shelly to get close to Roman, you can actually switch with him and discard Shelly completely. Yeah, but also uh, his internal monologue, this internal monologue thing was the first time Olivia's ever really been honest, which was weird. But basically, yeah. she was like, Shelly is big sad right now because of you. Mm-hmm. She doesn't really know it's because of you, but it's because of you. And Roman is too self obsessed to notice. Shelly is big sad. So who would Shelly go to for help? So they head to the White Tower. Now before this happens, um, there's a scene with Shelly where she breaks into, doesn't she go to, she goes to Olivia's apartment. Yes, so she goes to Olivia's apartment and breaks down the door and goes and overdoses on her depression medication and then somehow decides she's going to be a traffic cop. Yeah. And then the police come. Because she's and, just uh, standing in the middle of the road, waving her hands around, telling cars to go and stuff. But, like, she's not even at an intersection. She's just, like, in the middle of the street. Yeah. And um, so she gets uh, brought to the White Tower. Mm-hmm. And there's this really beautiful scene with Price and Shelly where they're talking about, like, why did Shelly do it? And Shelly's like, I just didn't want to feel the pain anymore. And Price says this whole thing about, like, how 
numbing the pain doesn't work because it never really takes away what made you feel that way. And like, obviously like he's saying all of this from experience and everything. And it's just really, really sweet. And um, then we have Olivia coming to visit with Shelly. Yes. To try to, to, to try and be motherly in a sense, but you no, know. she's being gaslighting yeah. and manipulative as fuck. And she's like, I'll always be there for you, but right now I need you to be there for me. And so, because of where the point that Shelly is at right now and doesn't really want to do the life thing anymore, Shelly agrees to letting Olivia transfer into her body and put Shelly in like this digital type of coma but there's no but price says well when basically they're telling them, Olivia Olivia doesn't know what she's talking about but she convinces Shelly that Shelly's consciousness will just like float in the ether until Olivia gets a new body and then Shelly can come back but price is like we don't have any fucking clue if that is even remotely possible mm-hmm. and Shelly's like I don't care I want to die. I don't, I want to disappear. I don't want to do this anymore. So I'm doing it. And um, Price is trying really hard to convince Shelly like not to and that she's worth more than her mom and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is when I wrote, Price is the only person I care about. Yes. And that is a true statement. Um, Obviously that's a true on Shelly, but Yes, but that is a very true statement. And with uh, Price is it's because Shelly said that she wants to, he was like, well, then we'll prep everything. But don't worry, Price doesn't lose any dignity. Um, he's still trying to talk Shelly into not doing it while he's doing the brain mapping and scanning. Um, and then Olivia's like, what's taking you so long? And then she go, he goes, well, um, Shelly's mind's a little bit more uh, intriguing than he said, yours. He said her mind's more intricate than yours. Uh, intricate than yours. Then you hear her mumble, "Little bitch," and Shelly overhears it. But and I don't. Price, I don't think she was talking about Shelly. I think she was talking about Price calling her stupid. Yeah. Um. And Price decides that instead of pulling up the brain map program, he's going to pull up some uh, White Tower CCTV. And shows Shelly Olivia ripping out Norman's heart and saying, you stole my heart and now I finally get to steal yours, or whatever that line was. And Shelly fucking loses it. Like, she has, she puts Olivia in a chokehold and she's going off on this. She's like, I hate you, you're a monster. And so, like, you're the most terrible thing. Like, you're the reason I am why you, I, the way that I am now. You shouldn't have really like, like, it. Like, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. Like, that's not real. He made that up. It's doctored footage. And Shelly literally is like, you know how you can't breathe right now? That's how I felt my whole life because of you. And she's like going off and she's basically like killing her mom. And then she lets go and she's like, but I'm not you. I might look like a monster, but you're the real one. (laughs) And she's like, and she refuses to like kill her because she's like, I'm not going to turn into you. And Price is like, got Olivia out of here and I don't ever want to see her at this on the premises again. on the premises ever again and mind you earlier Price said you can release whatever the hell you want about me put me in prison I don't give a shit like I'm not doing this yeah he's like I care about Shelly too much it does not matter send me to jail ruin my career that I I don't care I will deal with what I've done rather than let you steal this poor girl which, Johan, coming in for the win. And honestly, but when Shelly jumped up and grabbed Olivia by the throat, I wrote, hell yeah, Shelly. Like, this is the moment we have been waiting for. And like, and Shelly still doesn't know exactly what her mother is. He, she just saw her mother rip out her uncle's heart. Like, yeah. so, and like, and the fact that she doesn't even fully know everything that Olivia has done, the fucked up bullshit that she's done to not just her life to Roman's life to Norman's life to Price's life to everyone that she cares about the most just that set her off I think Shelly would have actually killed her if she knew everything 
Well, yeah. But yeah. also, it's amazing. Like, we know Shelly's big, right? Mm-hmm. But, like, Olivia, I mean, and Olivia is weak because she's sick right now. But I can't imagine that a weekend up here is still, is any, like, it would still be stronger than a normal human. And Shelly knocks her down like she is a paper straw. But here's the thing, like, she clearly still has strength because she was choking Johan. Right. Pretty much. So, like, she still has some strength in order to pick up Isaac and put him on a hook. Like, they're still strong. It's well, just... just- She's deteriorating very quickly. So I don't know, now that she's in the biting herself in her sleep phase of being sick, I don't know what her physical strength is anymore. But um, clearly, Shelly has more. Yeah. Shelly. Mm. Yeah. Down with the big bitch. Um, um, then we see Price up in his room, getting all ready for his date. Um, oh, because we missed a scene earlier, like very early in the beginning that was not really like useful, but basically Price was on the phone, made a date for that night, and um, Blinsky was trying to piece together what substance would kill Spivak. Mm-hmm. Um, so then Price is getting ready for his date. And that that scene with Price and Blinsky is more important in the Roman Peter storyline. But um, Price is getting ready for his date and Blinsky comes into his room and Price goes off. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you think if Mrs. Belinsky, if I barged in the other room when you and Mrs. Belinsky were getting ready to do things, would my presence be appreciated there? And he was like, uh, no, but there's a situation, uh, in the lobby, uh. <laughs> and Chris is like, what the fuck situation? I was like, because I really don't have time for this. I have a date with a hot man. Mm-hmm. And, um, Belinsky is like, uh, that Greek dude who you put your brain inside of, he's kind of losing his shit. Yeah. And Price is like, well, fuck. Um, so he calls Randolph and is like, hey, um, I'm running a little bit late. I'm not canceling on you, I promise. Um, but why don't you come here and I'll show you around the lab. And like, he's really excited to like show his boyfriend how like smart he is. Mm-hmm. And um, so then he goes down to uh, deal with uh, the Greek man. And the the guy is talking about like he he'll black out and do things that he regrets doing when he comes to like he was talking about how there was a cat nailed to his kitchen table with the head taken off and the intestines put in jars and he doesn't know how that happened and all this other stuff and while he's explaining he has another flip um where he eventually is now Price, and now Greek Price is what I'll call him, is accusing a real Price of being an imposter, a spy, someone who was paid to be there. Um, and he's like explaining how, like asking who sent him, all this other stuff. And then he says <laughs> to him something in Latin that Price translates after, and I didn't write down exactly what the translation was because I was too busy um, gasping and crying, Um, but the translation basically summed up was that like, you don't get to forget the wrong that you've done. Mm And, um, while, while this happens, um, Greek Price picks up a scalpel and stabs real Price in a specific spot, um, that would not 
be able to, based on the puncture wound and how deep the wound Yeah, he basically stabs him right in the center of his abdominal aorta, which means that there is about, even if a surgical team was already in the room, it would be very, very hard to fix that rupture fast enough. And um, then Greek Price has a like an embolism thing and basically from having two brains in his head and dies and Shelly walks in and sees Greek Price dead and she's like Uncle Johan and he turns around and there's blood all over him and his hands and Shelly does what Shelly does and ran over to him and she's like what do I do what can I do to help and she's like yelling for help and he was, she was like, where, where do I put this? And he was like, oh, at the center of the, at the spot, uh, location of the wound. So she puts her big gloved hand there. Well, no, and, she's asking what to do. And he's like, based on the location of the wound, there's, she's trying to like stop the bleeding, but he's like, it, it, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. And he's talking to her and with a smile on his face. And then he whispers something into Shelly's ear. I just need you to do one thing for me. And he whispers something that we still don't know in this episode. I don't know if, they'll, if it will ever be revealed. I don't think we'll ever know. No. And he tells it to Shelly, and he I, he says, I think, maybe one or two more words. And then... he's No, he does. He says two words. He starts a sentence. He said, it's so, and then doesn't and then, the sentence, which that was honestly infuriating to me. I know it's a trope in movies and things that, like, the characters who know the most, like, die without getting that last bit of information out. And based on something that I have learned about the finale episode, I think that they're going to try to use that it's so something to be some kind of, like, pseudo-religious moment. Mm -hmm. Which is dumb, because Johan is clearly not a religious man. Yeah. He's a gay scientist. There's nothing about him that screams religion. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so get ready for that. So get ready for, for that later. But um, we lost our only character that we, besides Shelly, that we really cared about this season and this whole series, honestly. And I feel like the the way the death happened, I think it was it wasn't a I feel like it was a cheap to kill uh, off you. I think it was cheap to kill him off. I think that um basically the producers of the show didn't know how to end the story, so they kill people instead of giving us a genuine ending because since the show was canceled, instead of leaving anything open for season four, they're just gonna kill everyone. I think it was um stupid um to give make it happen so fast and so um arbitrary as well yeah so but i will say by having johan kill himself essentially no other character gets the the satisfaction of being the one to kill him and that i'm extremely grateful for because if that, Olivia yes. had killed him, I would have, I would have been way more pissed. I don't know if I can say this without it seeming like a terrorist threat, but I would like to send a bomb to someone. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think because of Price's character development, I think killing Price off, because of us kind of knowing where things are heading in this last episode, and the projection of how the show ends with certain characters i think having him around for one of those characters would have been a very good thing i don't think it would have been wrong to keep his character alive i don't think it would have majorly impacted how the story ended oh i do i think that if he is alive for the finale some of the things that are going to happen won't happen yeah that's understandable so um also, in this moment of taking a moment to remember Dr. Johann Price and a memorial for him, 
I would just like to point out that I have liked Price from the beginning. Even you in, have. Even in season one where we weren't sure what team he was on, I was like, I don't know why, but I just, I just feel it in my gut that he is his first episode, I was like, we're supposed to hate him, but I'm kind of intrigued. And then there was me who didn't jump on the Johan train till season two. And a season one. I was kind of getting there. You were kind of getting there, but you still were afraid they were going to make a big, like, turnaround and still make him, like, the bad guy. But I don't... Season one, episode one, I was like, something about this guy. I know yeah. we're not supposed to trust him right now. But then in season two, Johan came out the fucking gate like a G. So, where I could see he was still had a very mixed conflict, but well, I can see. I, I never thought he was altruistic in any way. There was definitely gray, but I have been a big, I've been team Johan since day one. So um, this is very emotional for me. I'm not okay right now. Also, I watched this episode about two hours after watching the most recent episode of Grey's Anatomy, so, like, I'm just not okay. Yeah, and I don't watch Grey's Anatomy. This just is hard to watch. Um, but sadly, with Johan's death, ended the Johan storyline for this week's episode. No, there's one more scene. Um, right. There's one more scene. Randolph does get to the building, and he goes to the reception to and says, can you please tell Johan Price that Randolph is here? And then Shelly comes up still covered in blood and whispers something in his ear and he just crumbles. Yeah. And, and uh, David Paul Francis, you God. <laughs> he, I think David Paul, David Paul Francis really just knew, like he probably was just like, this is a character death that has to happen. But he did it in a way where it didn't make it so irritating to watch. Yeah. It actually felt like the death that if it, he had to die, that that was death he had to deserve. Yeah. Um, I, like but I I don't, said, the fact that he died in his own hands without it being. Not, and also just that Latin phrase and like one of Price's last things he said out loud was like that he has to like face the bad things, like, the wrong that he's done. He can't escape what he's done. And the thing is, is that part of me thinks that, yeah, if Price was alive, some of the things that happened in the finale wouldn't be able to happen. But I think that they could have written it a way where it could, that could have been possible. I'm, I really... I'm hoping, again... I know that it's not going to be a satisfying ending because it's somewhat grove, but I'm hoping it makes sense to not have him there. Yeah, if it was something, like, if the thing that me and you are both thinking of have zero reason to do with him, like, if he was there or not, would inflict um, the outcome. I don't want to spoil anything, so I'll, I'll explain my thoughts after next week. But mostly... I just kind of think, so um, like Monica and I said, we mentioned a few weeks ago that, spoiler alert, only one and a half of the main characters are going to survive. There are currently still five of them alive. which means there's still three more major deaths. Mm -hmm. I don't think the finale could storyline wise handle four deaths. And I think Price deserved his own moment. Yes, so, but the finale, the finale doesn't just have three deaths. The finale does have four deaths. But one is kind of a uh, one is one is still up for debate. I I and I the one that you're talking oh. about. I was thinking, oh, the one up for debate. That's not what I was thinking. I was thinking, I was thinking, not the one that me and you had talked about. I was I thought I was looping the one that we had talked about that was up for debate. Part of the three deaths, but when you said one and a half people survive that are the main characters, I just remembered. 
I'm an idiot. You are right. Keep talking. Okay. Because that, that half is what I think wouldn't happen if Price was alive. Really? See, and then there's me who I, I, cause the thing I was thinking no. that you were thinking. Actually, no, cause this isn't, this isn't super spoilery, but I, I'll talk about it when we get to the end of the other storyline. Okay. So, um, because kind of, it kind of seems like somebody else is dead at the end of this episode. Yeah. Which made it feel like this, if, like, this was coming out weekly, I would have thought that this was just a series finale, and I would just be like, okay, I guess this is over with. No, it could have been a season finale. There's no way it could have been a series finale. Yeah, that's fair. That's true. Um, so let's get to storyline number two. Um, we start off at Roman's house where Roman and Peter are, uh, preparing to go to Spivak's cabin, but Peter is still being real, um, sad. I was going to call him being a bitch boy, but no, he kind of deservedly is sad right now um, about Destiny and how her body just didn't even seem like her and like holding a cold dead body like did not make him feel any better. <laughs> Sorry, I'm out of allergy medicine. That's on my to-do list for today. Um, and Roman's being a little bitch. Yeah, that seems to be his only character trait this season. Yeah, and he's like, I know you're really upset, and I understand, and I know that it's not going to get better, but right now, I really need you, and Miranda and Nadia really need you. So they go to um, the thingamajig, the cabin. The thingamajig. And I have a very dumb note. Mm -hmm. And this, well, first, okay, so they get to the cabin. Roman links their phones on GPS in case they get separated, and they both have these massive guns. And Peter was like, I don't know what these guns are going to do. He's like, I don't either, but do you have a better idea? <laughs> um, so they get there, and they're sneaking into the house. And then this is my note that um, really has absolutely nothing to the, do with the plot, but it kind of bothers me. Uh, Peter very carefully closes the door behind him to not be loud. And this is something that bothers me in every single movie and TV show I watch where people are sneaking into something. Why the fuck, when you are sneaking somewhere to kill someone, are you concerned about closing the door behind you? Yeah. Maybe it isn't to draw attention to the house if there's a murder going on there. No, do you know um, what it is? Do you know what it is? It's well, so that the sound quality on the cameras doesn't die. When you're filming on location in a room and you open the door, it changes the air pressure and it fucks with the sound quality on cameras. And 100%, that is the only reason they do it. The audacity. Um, but they, the camera was lingering on it in a weird way that just brought it to my attention in a way that I was like, I still don't understand. Like, I technologically understand why it needs to happen, but don't show it. It just makes them look dumb. Yeah, that's fair. Um, now, well, basically, Peter and Roman are playing uh, the Hardy Boys in Speedback's cabin. Hold on. I have another note about this before they get to the next part while they're searching. The first room that they're in is like a living room, and over the fireplace, there is this mantle that is just full of art of the Ouroboros and Jormunder. And my note says that mantle is narcissistic as fuck. Well, also it's feedback. He's narcissistic as fuck. Right. But like, who just has, 
I mean, unless it's like that is his dead family. It, it could be. Like, is he, he's the last of his race. Right. So, like, it could just be like, oh, I got pictures of all my dead family. But, like, it just seems so freaking narcissistic. narcissistic to have a mantle full of just pictures of yourself. Well, then again, later on, which you watched the episode, so it doesn't really matter if I say this, but, like, later on, he compares himself to Adam. So, like, I really don't want to hear it. That motherfucker thinks he's Adam. Get out of my face. So, we go, they go and find the creepy basement. And my favorite line was before they go downstairs, uh, Roman said, something tells me this is not a wine cellar. <laughs> also, can, can, can I, can, can I, can, can I? Can you what? Talk about this next part. Hold on. So they get downstairs and they find the pools with the acid. And I just want to clar clarify the dead body that we saw in the image in Tom's eyeball was Pearl. Mm -hmm. oh. And oh, 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 oh. Oh, wait, no. Before, before, your favorite part. They're down there and they're looking around and they get a phone call. Oh, from Price. From Price. And Price is like, Blinsky has discovered the secret. Upir Venom is how you kill them. Uh, that's why they, he hates you so much. Your race wiped out his race. Um, and Roman's like, cool, I'll just bite him. And he's like, yeah, uh, based on the fact that uh, he stole your baby to make more babies, um, chances are there's going to be a lot of them. And yeah, you're not going to bite all of them. And Mary Kate's assumption when, when we first watched the, sec the first episode with Nadia back and the scars where her ovaries were, he took out her ovaries and used the ovum to use... Yeah, like, he did not have sexual relations with an infant. He just used her ovaries yeah. as, like, nests, um, which yeah. I did write, ew, I hate him, when they were describing what he had to do to create more babies. I, I, it's sick. Disgusting. Oh, yeah, it's disgusting and I hate it. I'm just really glad they didn't go that far past the line because they already are dabbling with grooming already. We don't actually yeah, need... But basically, um, well, but it wouldn't work. You couldn't have sexual relations with an infant and have a baby happen because the, cause the hormones in the body are not there yet. But the, the highest collection of undamaged eggs is in an infant. So he yeah. removed the ovary oh. to take the eggs out and fertilize them with hormonal work outside of the baby, mm -hmm. which is scientifically yeah. unethical as fuck, but accurate and creepy. Disturbing. Yes. Um, so okay. then they had to, in order to make sure they had enough, um, Upir Venom to kill all the babies. They had to uh, put a needle into the back of Roman's throat and extract the venom. But like, they didn't have time to get to Price to do it. So Peter had to do it and it was just gross. Yeah, and like Peter was like, in Price, you know, is Price. So he's using his big boy words and Peter's like, okay, what does the uvula, what is the uvula? Like, what, like, are you, oh, what are you even talking about? He like, oh, it looks like a little speed punching bag at a boxing gym. He's like, you could have just said that. <laughs> and he's like, okay, you're going to need to put it in a one quarter of an inch and not any more than that. And he's like, what happens if I go do more than that? He's like, Roman will be permanently deaf. Yeah. And he was like, um, he's like, so when you pull out, if it comes out right, I'll start to look for Roman for a new I'll hearing aid. I'll start Roman for a hearing aid. He's like, but if it comes out yellow, you got the venom. venom. Well, luckily, first try Peter doing anything biological, he gets the yellow venom, no blood, Roman can hear. Um, so, and Price is, like, FaceTiming them while they're doing this. So, like, Roman's holding the phone, like, what up, Price? How you doing, home slice? Uh, he's just, you know. And then something starts to move, and they go, oh, no, we'll call you back and hang up on him. Which I thought was, like, 
Wasn't that kind of dumb? Wouldn't you want to keep him on the phone just in case? Yeah. Now, the thing that moves is a little... This is before that. So. No, no, no. Well, it, it, because it's inside. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So. So, in, something makes noise and draws their attention to another acid bath. There are two down there. Um, and so they look in the pool and they hear this, like, slosh, this splashing around thing. And they get the pool skimmer and flip it up. And lo and behold, when Spivak took her stupid skank ass down to the bathroom, not bathroom, basement, Miranda's fucking dead. She's been dead since that episode that she was last in. That's when she died. She's been dead well, this whole time. That's not when she died. That's when she was put into the acid to become a carrier. Yes. So as, as later on in um, their storyline right now, you'll understand why they're, they are put in the tubs of acid and for the reasoning behind everything. Um, well, you kind but, of understand it. You kind of understand it shortly after this, but, but like the actual detail later. So, and they, so, oh, do you want to go? I was going to say, they take Miranda's body out, and they're trying to figure out what to do with this acid wash fucked up body, which this is what I don't understand. What the fuck was in that acid? Because, like, her tattoo was still there. That's how they knew it was her. And her sweater was still on, but her face was fucked up. What kind of acid? Disintegrates your skin, but not your clothes or your tattoo. I, it was just like, hey, we have to make sure that Roman and Peter know who these people, the people are. So leave every distinct feature that's there besides their actual faces. So um, Peter is going through it. He's having a moment. And um, he's like, why do bad things happen to every woman that we care about? And then all of a sudden something starts to move again. And they pull the blanket off of, that they had put over Miranda's body off of it. And there's a little baby speed back in her stomach. And he pops on out and squeegees underneath this like, like a uh, rack against a uh, secret passageway. Um, so so I'll Ro let you go off on this one. Now. Well, hold on. I have two things. So they go and they find the secret passageway. And Roman opens the door, like figures out where the secret passageway is, and calls Peter over to come to the secret passageway. Only when he says there's a passageway, he suddenly forgets what an American accent sounds like. And he said the word passageway in full on Swedish accent. Like it was so ridiculously obvious. He, he said, you know what? Now this is Bill now because I'm kind of done with this shit. I found this passageway, bro. Let's just get this shit on the move. Yeah, he literally was like, passage why? I was like, the fuck? What, what happened to your voice, my dude? <laughs> <laughs> then they go in this passageway. And they follow the little thingamajig and they test out the opier venom and it sets on fire and it's a beautiful blue green fire because sulfur and um so then they follow the passageway let's get to where they get to and then go on the ramp so they follow the passageway and they're like it leads to a dead end and then they're like wait no there's a hatch and they climb out the hatch and they appear and a gorge at the base of Niagara fucking Falls. They don't say it's Niagara Falls, but they show a close-up of the water enough that if you know anything about anything, there is no place else in the world that has that much water. It's yep. fucking impossible. Also, Hemlock Grove was filmed in Ontario, so like, this is literally on location at the base of the falls. In fact, it is, I recognize the part of the abandoned power plant that they filmed it at it's literally across the border from my house. I can see it from five feet away from my house. I know exactly where this filming location is. But here's 
the fucking problem. These motherfuckers have this set in Erie, Pennsylvania. Now, I don't know how many of you who are watching this are familiar with the geography of the Eastern United States. But Erie, Pennsylvania is at minimum a two hour drive from the American side of Niagara Falls. So how in the absolute motherfuck did these two walk for 20 minutes in an underground passageway and end up on the Canadian side of the fucking falls when they were in Southern Erie. Please tell me how dumb you think your fucking audience is that they weren't gonna recognize Niagara fucking falls. Did, did they just expect people to watch and go like, oh, I didn't know Pennsylvania had a waterfall. It, would have been it wasn't nothing. like they just showed, oh, we're at a waterfall. They had multiple close-ups of the water. Oh, yeah. And I was, I, I was like, at first, like, I was happy. Like, she told me about where they end up that, when I called her that day. I called her earlier today before I watched the episode. And she's like, I want you to watch this and tell me if it makes sense. And I did, and I was like, no. But then at the same time, I was also kind of psyched because I was like, yo, Bill Skarsgård was right fucking there. He was right there. As beautiful as it is to think about Bill Skarsgård being that close to my house. This fucking show really thought that they were going to get away with that. And they didn't. And to be honest, they probably did get away with it because a lot of people are dumb. Yeah, that's also fair. And I nice get it. They were like, oh, we're filming in, er er in Ontario. Um, we need a place that has a lot of water. Um, this abandoned power plant is the perfect setting. Um, it's cheaper to film on location than to try to make a soundstage of something like this. I understand all of the logistical reasons. But now, Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, filmed on location in Niagara Falls. All of the waterfalls in that movie are actually Niagara Falls, but you don't know that because they used CGI to make it look like a different thing because it was not set anywhere near Niagara Falls. Also, none of the actors were there, so don't feel bad. Johnny Depp was not there. It was just it was just the location scouting team and camera crew. I know because I, I was, it was when I was working near the falls. So I knew what was going on. Okay. But when you watch the movie, you don't know that that's where that was because it wouldn't yeah, make I would sense. Have, I, would, I legit did not know that until you just said that. Yeah, it, it just, it wouldn't make sense for it to be there for the plot of the story. In this show, it also doesn't make sense for it to be there for the plot of the story. But they said, fuck it. We're gonna show a wide angle shot of the entire falls, horseshoe and American, just water everywhere and pretend it's not fucking Niagara Falls. Also, you froze, but I'm leaving my rant in there. Okay. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Now, after we uh, found out that Niagara Falls is not a 20-minute walk from Erie, Pennsylvania. Don't worry. Um, things don't get better from here. No. Literally, none of it. Um, so, they end up going into the actual abandoned power plant, not just the basement part where, they, where the tunnel was. They go inside the uh, power plant. Oh, wait. There's one moment. Oh, yeah. They're standing outside looking at the water, trying to figure out what to do next. And Peter says, before we do this, I just need to get something off my chest. And he said, after everything that's happened the last few years, like, and how crazy things have been, I just want to say thank you for always being with me 
and like having my back. And Roman was like, of course, we're family. And it's very beautiful. Except for it's not beautiful because you know what Roman has done. But also, I mean, is it really his fault? Because what kind of example has he had of what family means? True. Like, have you met his parents? True. So, also, um, he two of his three sisters. Yeah. And honestly, if Shelly yeah. was pretty, he probably would have fucked her too. Probably. <sighs> um, but they go the power plant, and they see more pools of acid, and a guy sit who's alive still sitting in a pool of acid. Um, and Roman and Peter go to him like, "We're gonna try and get you out of here," and they go to lift him up. And like, no, 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 you can't. His skin will tear off. So like, it's like melted him to this, like, thing that he is in right now. And basically, he's explaining that um, people are food for these creatures, and Eve is food for Adam, and all this weird stuff about something, and then his stomach bursts. And you got saying Adam needs his rib back, referring to needing to consume Eve to get his rib back. Right, because for those of you who are not versed in the Bible, um, in the story of Adam and Eve and creation, God made Adam and then um, decided that it wasn't good for men to be alone and used Adam's rib to create Eve. So woman, literally the reason the word woman comes from being part of man. Anyway, mm -hmm. so this man's stomach bursts and all of his little baby stingrays burst forth. And now, all of mind you, I could stomach the visual effect of the baby stingrays. They literally just looked like baby stingrays. They didn't yeah. look like weird, black, gross monster things. I couldn't really stomach the actual stomach burst, though. That was nasty. He would literally looked pregnant. Like he had a pregnant belly and then it just went just like ugh. But then from high above, we hear Spivak saying, ah, oh, the beauty of childbirth. And I immediately wanted to throat punch him. <laughs> and um, he comes down and he's like taunting Roman and Peter. And he's like, um, there's no, no more competition for food. I'm getting rid of your species so that only my species is here to feed on the humans. There are food, not yours. Um, I, this is the new garden of Eden and I am Adam and from my loins, I'm resurrecting my whole species, blah, 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 all this creepy shit. And, um, yeah. But in this speech, he's saying all this stuff about like how we needed the Godfrey genes and all this stuff to like make the baby. And um, Peter gets this weird idea that uh, uh, Spivak impregnated Letha. And Spivak almost uh, like said who the father was. He spills the beans about Roman, but Roman is like. Where the fuck is Nadia? Because Spivak says, hey, I might have wings, but I'm no angel. Yeah. So, which also really means that he knew that because he treated, um, when Letha was pregnant, he treated her at first before she ended up being sent to Johan. Yeah. Um, so, he knew that she thought that he, she was pregnant by an angel. Um, well, and also, he, knew, he knows everything because he kind of like, just already knew everything. But yeah, he's been trying to get this to happen forever. Um, and then um, Peter's like, the fuck? Like, you're not going to win. And he drips some of the venom into the pool and all the baby stingrays die. So Spivak's like, no, and he starts to go and try to like flush all the whirlpools so that all the little 
carrying tanks full of baby stingrays will like get flushed into the water system so that they will be out in the river and out mm -hmm. in the world. Honestly, could you imagine, just going back to this whole Niagara Falls thing, Niagara Falls is already a shithole. Could you imagine if like the Niagara River was just infested with fucking demons? It kind of already is. But not demons that eat us. That's fair. That's fair. Um, so anyway, um, then in the most anticlimactic ending to a two season arc of a bad guy, uh, Roman shoots Spivak a couple times and obviously it does nothing because bullets don't kill this weird fucker. And um, then his gun runs out and Spivak's gonna attack him. But then Peter shoots him in the side of the face. And while he's distracted by Peter, Roman comes and chomps on his neck. And then that whole storyline is done. We because, see a little... Because like while, little... while Roman's fighting Spivak, Peter has already poured acid into every single one of the carrying tanks. So all the babies are dead too. And we get one more little glimpse at this disgusting thing that was Spivak's creature in this like weird like swishing motion and then he turns into a little snake in the Ouroboros thing. And the way he finally gets put down for good is Roman, step, Roman stepping his foot on him. So for uh, two seasons, we've been trying to figure out how this Jormunder and the Upir are related and what's going on. And then, oh, just kidding. All Roman has to do is bite him and then step on him and boom, we're done. And also, mind you, when we first learned about the species that Spivak was, he was told as a tale as like the boogeyman to Upiers. Right. When they were the, to be like the, scariest, the scariest thing to Upiers. And like, granted, the scientific knowledge and the shit that this guy has been doing forever in order to put out Upiers is terrifying. But if the Upir is that much stronger than them. Yeah. Well, granted, physical strength, they're not because Spivak, before. Roman shoots, or after Roman shoots him, before Peter shoots him, he, like, releases his tail and grabs his weird fucking stingray tail and grabs Roman and is, like, squeezing him, and Roman can't get out, so this thing is stronger than them. Yeah. But if all it takes is one chomp to the neck, why the fuck have you been afraid of it for thousands of years? And no wonder why their whole race got wiped out by Upiers, because they're little bitch boys. Right. Um, so then so we go to a scene <laughs> where Annie is prepping her gun. And she's coating all the bullets with heparin. Which we learned during Norman's whole ordeal that in order to kill it up here, you have to use the heparin because it slows down their like regeneration abilities. So I was like, bitch, who are you trying to kill? I mean, there's only really three options. Yourself, Roman, or Olivia. Yeah. Unfortunately, she was looking at the, the worst of those three possibilities. Mm -hmm. So, we go back to Roman's house, and he's interviewing a nanny for the baby, and um, Peter's like, do you really think it's a good idea to have a stranger around the baby again? And I wrote my question exactly, Peter. I don't know what the fuck's going on. Also, I don't really know what the whole point of having the nanny scene was because the nanny does not have the baby ever again. It was dumb. Just dumb. Basically, the only important thing in that scene was that 
Roman was still trying to console Peter, and Peter was like, yeah, well, if you figure out a way to stop the pain, let me know. Mm -hmm. So then, apparently, Peter takes Roman, or I'm sorry, Peter takes Nadia to the park, and he's playing with her at the park, and Annie shows up. And um, in true Godfrey fashion, she's not a Godfrey, but she is Olivia's child. Um, she is a fucking bitch. Mm -hmm. And she tells Roman, or she tells Peter everything about Roman. And like, I get it. Peter deserves to know the truth and Annie doesn't want to see him hurt anymore. And she doesn't agree with what Roman did and she's having a really hard time with it. But like, the boys were finally back to normal. They had their baby. They were friends again. And then... About to shoot Mr. Mom two up in that bitch, and then she came. And then away. for the third season in a row, some dumb bitch woman gets in between them. Mm -hmm. Which is really unfair, and I shouldn't be so angry about Annie because yes, Roman is a piece of shit. But but like here's the, here's the thing that I will say. The thing with, which I don't, I never minded Annie's character. She was like the only female that we had that was actually pretty decent in her rules, but she is an oopier with morals, which, fine. But you are entering a lawless zone here, lady. Right. Like, and, imagine, imagine joining the purge and trying to be the one to tell them stealing's wrong. Yes. And like, for me, with, with Annie in this scene specifically, she. And, like, this is where it bothered me with her character towards the end, where it's like she thinks that Roman needs to follow her moral compass. Right. And live like her, and she, if, she, if he doesn't, he's this God-ridden person. And not understanding all the stuff that has happened from season one to now, and she comes in here with a savior complex trying to help, which is fine, that she wants to help better him. But Roman, if he doesn't want the help, don't force it. And don't make a judgment call based on a situation that you weren't involved in happened in. Right. And also, like, I get it that, like, she is, she has very strong moral beliefs. But, like, who are you to tell someone else what is right and wrong for them? Like, you can suggest, like, the co I was never angry at the conversations she had with him about finding Jesus and about repenting, like, trying to help him see the light, but you don't get to make that decision for him. Yes. Um, so she tells Peter, and he's like, I don't believe you. And she's like, then how would I know about the cross on her forehead? And then he was like, oh. He's like, I'm sorry, what? So she tells him everything, and then she tells him that she's going to kill Roman because he's out of control. Mind you, at the same time as this is happening, we see that Roman is in fact out of control and decides the blood bag in his fridge is not enough, and he's going to go kill somebody. Mm -hmm. So Peter's yeah, like... Real quick, can I just say one thing about this this scene in particular with Roman saying fuck it and going to kill a person? Yeah. I, I think um, the writers were like, shit, we know Roman's a very well-liked character and is struggling with this thing, but let's throw this at the wall and say fuck it, he's going balls deep in this being this moralist monster that he said he never wanted to be and now he is, where it's yeah. like, yes, I think kind of a drama, but I mean, it wasn't anything that I thought, like, I, I don't think him deciding to kill a person, one person, is going to completely change, because he already killed one person earlier this season, that I don't think it's going to completely change my view right. entirely on him. I mean, granted, my, my three notes about this ending, before the actual ending, I have a note about the actual ending, but my three notes about this whole interaction is, Annie sucks. Peter, you're an emo bitch, and Roman, what the fuck? Yeah. Basically, they were like, shit, the show is ending. We're going to have a really big, like, devastating finale. We want fans to feel some kind of satisfaction. So, so let's take every character that they've liked and 
make them do shit that's so out of character that it'll piss them off. Like, yeah, but every single thing that every character's doing in this last episode, like involving these three, is nothing like their characters have no, shown. Annie's a hundred percent being herself. It's just that she's her holier than thou messiah complex is out of hand. Yes, but Peter and Roman's reaction is so out of character. Yes. Peter is never rash. Peter, I mean, granted, he's very, very emotionally traumatized right now, and I get him being rash, but in all of this, he has, in the whole thing with Destiny and Andreas in this whole season, and everything with Roman in the first two seasons, he has been the one to think things through before they did something. Yes. Where was that? Exactly. Like, he never even went to, just because, like, like, even though it was true, he never thought to go and speak to Roman, who was his friend, to get the truth from him first. Who was not just his friend, who at this point is his family. They just had that whole conversation. Yes. And, and to believe Annie because of an ex, which, like, not saying that obviously, like, it didn't, ha- like, it happened, but he didn't even bother to be Peter and be like, be honest with me, is this what happened? Right. He just uh, takes... And his guns, and it's like, he'll never see it coming. I'll do it. I'm his friend. And I was like, uh, what? So then um, he goes to where uh, Roman has just killed a prostitute in an alley. And just without hesitation or question or word, shoots him. Yeah. Like, we don't even know that he's, like, there. He's chomping on this girl's neck. Her body thuds. Then we hear a gunshot. And then Roman turns around like, the fuck, bitch? Strowman beats the fucking gun out of his hand, and Peter's like, psych, bitch, I also have a knife. And he's trying to, because- like, yes, he's swinging at him, and Roman's like, who told you? It was Annie, wasn't it? So, obviously, Roman knows why Peter's upset. Mm-hmm. But Roman, because, you know, he is now no longer um, a caring friend who has guilt and has been feeling like shit for the last four episodes, trying to, like, deal with Peter's trauma and knowing that Peter will never forgive him suddenly because you know one one dead prostitute and we are now raging killing monster with no heart um he uh gets the knife away and stabs Peter with it and then chomps on his neck and leaves him for dead and then slowly backs away and sobs a teeny tiny bit and then roll credits Yeah. So my thought is that this is why how Peter becomes a Vargo. In order to heal himself, he becomes a wolf. And then Uh, now the reason why I think losing price is important is because if there was an option of healing Peter that wasn't wolfing out, it would change the story. But my only thing with that is because the reason, the only way that I think Peter being able to change without having to go full wolf. It, it would be very difficult to get him to price now that he and Roman are not on the same side. And agreed. Then, agreed. But it still takes that option completely off the table. That is fair. But I think that's with circumstantial, if price did stay alive, I feel like even if he still was, it would have been a, a possibility, but because of where Roman and Peter stand now, I don't think... Me but I, would have I ever- don't think Roman... I think it would have been one of those moments where Roman regrets it and calls Price and makes Price fix it because he doesn't actually want to kill Peter. Okay, that's fair. That, that's not... But- but if they're portraying him as this heartless killing monster, he wouldn't right, want to do that. Right, but I mean, that's the thing is, I don't actually know because we've suddenly just decided that none of our characters um, are who they were for the last uh, 27 episodes, so that's fun. Um, so, yeah. But that's why I think Price dying, this whole fight between Peter and Roman and there being no way out... Price has to die. Because if Price could heal either of them totally, it wouldn't be... 
Yeah. Because I was thinking you were talking about someone else's storyline, which no. I thought would have had more claws to it, but not at the same time. Like, there, there's ways that I feel like he could have just stayed alive. Um, and, and honestly, it all depends on how they carry out next. Right. I mean, to be honest, that's, I mean, that's just a theory. I can't imagine, because obviously, like, we know Peter isn't dead at the end of this episode because he's still in next week's episode unless it's some shit where like he's alive for 14 seconds yeah but the only way i can think of him healing himself is to fully wolf yeah so that's that um olivia i don't know what she's gonna do I think Olivia's just, I think Olivia's SOL at this point. Oh, she for, really is. For, no, for cool. sure, but, like, what's she gonna do to try to not be? I think before the self-cannibalism sets in, because now that Price is dead, there's no way that that's, that she's getting a new body. Yep. Um, her death is pretty much, you know, without yeah, a doubt. death is pretty much written in the stars at this point, because now that Price is dead, even if she could get Roman or Annie to agree... There's what, no way. There's no way. Blinsky probably could, but but there was this also this whole scene that was really funny that I didn't talk about it because it was not really super important, but Price was talking about how Blinsky's a fucking idiot and how now that he figured out that the Upir Venom was the thing, it's just going to go to his head and make him think that he's smarter than he is, which is fucking horrible. <laughs> and Blinsky's like, Blinsky not really smart enough to do this without Price. Yeah, and like Price, even when he did it, obviously there were but issues. It didn't work. So it's um, I don't like obviously like we said, Olivia's death is kind of written in the stars, and I think we're gonna just see a lot of Olivia self indulging in her hallucinations and going completely insane, and I think we're probably gonna get something like her dream where she thought she was eating a shit ton of food, but it was actually herself in the dream. I think it's gonna be something like that. I mean, okay, so we already said there's three and a half more deaths. Olivia's definite. Ooh. And um, Peter going full wolf. Just, I mean, it doesn't really ruin anything, but if he does go full wolf to save himself, that would be like a the half death. Ooh. So, uh, Dear fans who actually listen to this, take a wild guess who the other two are. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like they'll guess one, but not the other. Well, I mean, the only three left are the three God for the th- Olivia's three children. Yeah. So That's only one of them gets to live. Yeah. <sighs> this is going to be a fun episode next week. Next week? You mean like tomorrow? Yeah, because we're filming on Wednesday. Yeah, fun fact. So this episode comes out, what you're watching right now will come out on March 28th. We always film like a full week before we record. But my birthday is the 25th of March. And for the whole weekend after my birthday, I'm indulging because it was my last birthday in Thailand and my friends and I have plans galore, including um, a three hour uh, spa package, a high tea at a fancy resort, a rooftop bar, like all of the things. So I uh, will not be available for the weekend. So we are filming on Wednesday. So literally only three days away from now. Which will be nice because then we'll never have to fucking watch the show again. Yeah. Oh my god. Just think about it. Three more days and we'll never have to watch Hemlock Grove again. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay, um, we will talk about it for like two more episodes. Three. Three more episodes. So, actually... For our poor viewers, there's actually five more Hemlock Grove episodes. Oh, I, yeah. Kind of. 
Three more that were, were filmed. Two three were more, like three more that we have to film because we've talked about this. Um, I'm also moving back to America shortly, so there are a couple weeks where you will be getting a compilation and footage and bloopers and things like that as your episodes, which will probably be hysterical for you, but it just means that we don't have to record because I won't have time to record and edit while also leaving the country. Um, so five more Hemlock Grove episodes for you guys. Yes. And then one little surprise episode, which we will announce at the DNA Awards, which we cannot wait to announce. So, uh, um, speaking of the DNA Awards, don't forget to send us your nominations, your category ideas, anything that you want us to talk about. Um, we will post stuff about it. Also at the DNA Awards, we are going to be announcing our next in-betweener episode our, that we are- And our next and series. Oh. Oh my God, it's gonna be so nice to say goodbye to Hemlock Grove. I know. Sorry, I really have to pee really, really bad and we're about to end this. So like, let's just end it. Um, You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at- oh. What? Saving Grace and punching in the face. Oh, fuck. Okay, you're right. Sorry, sorry. Saving Grace, we can both agree on that. And Shelly. Slash Price. Yes. Yeah. And then Punch in the Face, Peter and Roman, and a little bit of Annie. Yeah, Annie, Olivia, Chongo, Peter, Roman, and the producers of this show. Yes. Um, you can follow us on Death and Aliens at, uh, on Instagram and Twitter and email us at death and aliens, uh, at gmail.com. Follow me on uh, Twitter at E-M-K-A-Y underscore superstar. And you can follow me on Instagram at Monica.Lynn underscore and on Twitter at Mon underscore Lynn underscore. And that's it for this week's episode. We'll see and, you guys uh, I apologize week. for how rushed and ridiculous this ending is, but like, I just, we've already been on this call for like seven hours and I'm about to pee myself. And so it's just not worth it to keep talking about this dumb fuck show. Yep, so we'll see you guys next week for the finale. Peace.